Hi, my name is Paul Schaffer. I work for Syria, which is a construction industry research information association, and I coordinate the work that we do on sustainable water management. So thank you for joining us, Paul. And um, I wonder if you could help us out with a few questions. Uh, I'd like to start by asking you, what are the critical elements of water-sensitive urban design? Good, good question. Uh, there's a number of elements of water-sensitive urban design that takes it beyond where we currently are with sustainable drainage. So the, the three main elements are connecting the water cycle, collaborating with people and creating great places. And when, we're, when we talk about connecting the water cycle, we're, we're looking at both how we manage our surface water with a view to managing flood risk and also thinking about the issues around water quality. We're also thinking about water supply in terms of where water comes from, using appropriate sources of water, whether that be rainwater harvesting or black water from our wastewater. And also thinking about wastewater, essentially, in terms of where does that go? Are we making the best use of that? In terms of collaboration, for the best schemes, both for sustainable drainage and also for water into urban design, we need to bring a whole myriad of disciplines together, ranging from your engineer, but also landscape architect, those people that are involved in looking at ecology, urban design and highways. We really need to have a, a family of disciplines involved in delivering good practice. And hopefully with those people, we can create great places bring water to our urban environment, celebrate that water, and create places where people want to live, uh, play, and work. Um, and Paul, this um, idea of Sads and Wasads um, has been very topical recently. Is it something new? Is it something that has been, been worked on by uh, you and your organization yeah. for some years? Could you give us a bit of background to that? Yeah. So, I mean, sustainable drainage is really about moving us away from a, an approach where we viewed surface water has been a problem where we dispose that to uh, our surface waterways and rivers as quickly as possible. We now really want to make the best use of that by ensuring that we, we don't move uh, uh, the water downstream, creating a flood risk. And we also provide opportunities to uh, treat that water and also looking at this amenity and biodiversity in terms of creating great spaces. So Syria as an organisation has been looking at this area for about 15 years or so. Uh, so we've produced a number of guidance documents. We've got a good website called Sosdrain that provides information on that. And we're basically trying to go for the whole circle, providing guidance and disseminating good practice. Uh, water sensitive urban design is really a concept that's been looked at with regards to uh, managing issues of water quality in Australia. But again, it talks about the whole water cycle. And bearing in mind, in 2012, we were concerned about droughts and the impact that had on the Olympics. And then at the latter part of 2012, we also had issues with flooding. It's about joining things up. So whilst it's taken us 15 years to get some progress on sustainable drainage, we don't necessarily want to wait that long on uh, water cycle management. And that's why we're promoting water sensitive urban design. Uh, very good. But um, I've had a lot um, over the last month or two in particular. And um, it strikes me that uh, we've had a lot of different terminology coming out over, certainly over the, the, the last year, but, yeah. but also in the last months. Um, and we've got the terms for the infrastructure, um, like blue, uh, green and, and grey. Could you give us a bit of an idea as to where they're coming from? Sure. Well, grey infrastructure is primarily talking about the heavily engineered infrastructure, the legacy infrastructure we've got on the ground in terms of our sewers and our storage tanks. And more recently, the environmental regulators, environment agency, and the economic regulators for the water industry off what have suggested that we can no longer keep on building more grey infrastructure under the ground. We need to think about more sustainable, more economic ways of managing our surface water. So yeah, so green infrastructure is essentially uh, looking at the way uh, that we deliver green spaces in our urban environments, looking at the contributions that biodiversity can make and the services that we get from ecosystems in terms of provisioning benefits like wood, fuel, water, provisioning, uh, provisioning as I just said, and also looking at opportunities for regulating climate change, flood risk, and there's also more esoteric benefits around culture in terms of contributions to community and recreation, stuff like that. So. So that's, that's grey, that's green, and blue infrastructure really fits into those wet aspects of the green infrastructure. So often you hear about blue-green infrastructure being merged, and those 
the blue green infrastructure is really inherent in the one of the approaches that we're taking forward in sustainable drainage where we want to integrate the grey approaches and also some of the more proprietary products that are, out, that are out there so trying to get the, eat the best benefits out of a site really so we're trying to get that mixture of green and blue and also some of the engineered components of proprietary systems. Uh, that's great Paul and that really leads into the next question maybe partially answers it um, and I was going to ask you've spoken about grey and you've spoken about proprietary products, um, but what do you think the role of the proprietary products in sustainable drainage really is? So, I mean, sustainable drainage isn't a one, one solution fits all. Sustainable drainage is a philosophy where you're trying to manage the water wherever possible on the surface and close to that source. Sometimes you have to work within the opportunities and constraints of a site. So if there is limited space, it might be more appropriate to have a proprietary product in there, maybe a geocellular drainage system or something providing some water quality benefit. But there's also an opportunity really to start thinking about the ways that you integrate proprietary systems and green infrastructure in a way that proprietary system may provide you some treatments before it goes into a green vegetated system like a swell or a detention basin or something else. Thank you, and um, I'm going to look now to uh, the broader subject of decentralisation. New terminology yeah. or not? Uh, it's new to it's it's new to parts of the UK. I mean, at the moment we have a fairly centralised approach where the water companies provide uh, our sewage infrastructure and also our water supply infrastructure and what we're thinking about here is having more centralized approaches to managing our surface water and also in some cases our water supply so there might be opportunities that some on surface water could be a potential resource used in a building and that would be a decentralized approach and that could be beneficial in terms of providing greater adaptation to climate change and urban growth and also provides a better opportunity for robust responses to any changes that we have. So it, there's, there's growing research going on that looking at the role of decentralised approaches in dealing with the many issues about uh, water management in terms of providing a more direct and specific response. And finally, with regard to the, uh, the Act, because that is very topical, yeah. um, where does SUDS fit? Where are we with SUDS? SUDS is one of the last elements or schedules of the Flood and Water Management Act. So the Flood and Water Management Act was uh, passed into legislation in 2010 and we're still waiting for elements of that act to be laid before government. So the Schedule 3, which still specifically with sustainable drainage, passes on a responsibility to lead local flood authorities to approve and adopt sub schemes over a certain size. So that's been going through a series of machinations with DEFRA taking the lead on that. Uh, there was a consultation document that came out in 2011 and DEFRA have been working with the various stakeholders, primarily local authorities and the Hem Builders Federation in working out a, a good way forward to make sure that there are going to be some standards and some guidance. So the standards are going to be very high level, very non-prescriptive requirements that uh, developers will need to meet and local authorities will need to approve against that. And if a scheme meets those standards, they will then be adopted by, by the local authority. So it's taking some time. There's lots of issues about making sure the resources are in place and that whatever comes out from those standards is going to be fair and equitable and we get the right outcomes. Excellent, Paul. I know you've just landed from Australia where you've been talking the same subject, so thank you very much for, for joining us at the Echo on Airbox here at EcoBuild.